that happened. This video is a pretty different one to what I usually make, since I've never really done anything like this on the channel before, going over a piece of media before it's even out, but this is most definitely the right time for such a video, considering the recent footage reveals of a certain show. Prehistoric Planet, first announced back in 2019 with Jon Favreau at the helm, recently had both a teaser and short clip released, and well, it's everything us paleontology fans have been waiting for. Collaborating with BBC Studios' Natural History Unit, the division behind Planet Earth and Blue Planets, the series, utilising modern and up-to-date graphics and technology, is set exclusively in the late Cretaceous, and will feature animals and environments from a variety of different countries and continents, whether they be tropical, dry, or temperate. The series will be composed of five episodes, each 40 minutes long, which will be premiering as such as a five-night event beginning on May 23rd until May 27th of this year. The series also notably features David Attenborough, who will be narrating the series, something especially notable considering he was initially approached to narrate Walking with Dinosaurs before they ultimately went with Kenneth Branagh, as he turned down the powers, citing his unwillingness to support a fictitious and fake wildlife documentary due to the use of CGI and a good deal of speculation. His reasons were somewhat valid considering nothing on Walking with Dinosaurs scale has been done up until that point, as well as the CGI animals potentially being misleading and over-dramatising them. Although with its success, and that high-quality paleontology documentaries can indeed be done properly and with respect, it's great to see him being involved with prehistoric planets. With him being present, this will hopefully give this documentary even more attention given how well known he is, and will, for a great number of people, introduce dinosaurs in a much more updated and realistic light. Hans Zimmer, one of the most notable film score composers, is also involved, providing an original score for the series, having himself being involved with both Planet Earth and Blue Planets 2. And from what's been seen from the teaser, and potentially the trailer, it's already shaping up to be excellent, which is to be expected, considering. As well as this, the involvement of notable paleontologists like Darren Nash, Mark Wooten, and Scott Hartman, who from what we know have acted as much-needed consultants that as we've seen already, has led to a great deal of much-needed, up-to-date reconstructions, and alongside the involvement of numerous other artists, it's shaping up to be a much-needed step in the right direction when it comes to restoring these animals, and by utilising those who know best on these subjects to properly showcase the knowledge and assist in the overall process, it all goes a long way. From what I've heard, the KPG Extinction event also won't be shown, which is a nice change after the meme of ending a large majority of these shows with their demise, so that more time can instead be focused on the animals themselves, while not taking away from them with their demise, and the intricacies of that. With more of the background details surrounding the creation of the documentary and those involved covers, it's about time to talk about the main takeaways from the trailer and teaser, that's being the incredible, up-to-date reconstructions of numerous Mesozoic animals. As someone passionate about paleontology, and how their reconstructions have changed over time, I can assure you that these designs are easily some of the best and most up-to-date ever put out in media, and do a great service in showing off how amazing these animals are. Regarding the trailer, the first animal's features are some kind of titanosaur, based on their anatomy, and may well represent Stresnautus, one of the larger members of their group. The most noticeable thing about their appearance is their interesting neck display, which has been covered in more detail in these videos here, and appears very unusual indeed. Just what are these structures meant to be exactly? From some inferred speculation, it appears that these balls, that appear to expand, have something to do with the extensive network of air sacs that sauropods possessed, and it's been noted that said structures and their placement, size, and method of inflation is actually quite conservative regarding their potential extent. Essentially, these structures represent where the airfield diverticular are known to be based on the pathways between the nostrils and the air sacs in the torso, which while also aiding in respiratory functions, also allow them to reduce their overall body weight, allowing them to grow to unprecedented sizes because of this. This display is therefore showcasing some speculation on what if the diverticular inflates as air went to and from the lungs and air sacs, manifesting itself through expandable skin. It may seem absurd, but considering plenty of birds using similar systems get far more crazy with theirs, it's not really all that ridiculous, and essentially could well serve as a signal to show their strength and that they're a healthy animal, for showing that their lungs are healthy. It's definitely on the speculative size, but when compared to other animals that have these structures, it's actually pretty conservative, and while the means as to how it functions have and are being discussed, it's a step in the right direction in showing the potentially more unusual size of non-avian dinosaurs. The next animal features is very likely to be Velociraptor, although some discussions have indicated that more is going on with them behind the scenes, but wow the feathers! 
Appropriately feathered and lived, this is hands down the most up-to-date and accurate these animals have ever looked when it comes to CGI media, and also shows off a great level of detail. They even have distinct levels of feathers on the body, particularly further along the snails, with them possessing rectal bristles, more simple feathers consisting of only the rachis, the central stem of the feather. These feathers can still be seen today in modern birds, mostly around the eyes and mouth opening, and while the purpose is still being discussed, potentially for particle collection or communication, it's really neat to see. Their eye even focuses as they look towards the camera, which is another cool detail. Pterosaur-wise, a Hatsogopteryx is also shown flying overhead, possessing some really neat striping on their necks, as well as a decently sized crest, which while not being fully known from them due to their scant remains, is still a nice inference to see. They also have a fluffy tail as well, which is composed of pycnofibers, homologous to the filaments and feathers in dinosaurs, with recent studies showing that they were virtually identical and bore no obvious physical differences. A Tyrannosaurus is next shown swimming alongside three chicks, which as will be covered later on are a family group, and are appropriately well muscled and lipped. Cutting away to a more dynamic scene, a Quinjalosaurus is seen chasing a group of Carithoraptor through a forest, with their blue coloration making it apparent that they may very well be the animal representing the promotional arts, with their eye and surrounding feathers and scales being seen in exquisite detail. The Quinjalosaurus also has a decent amount of filaments covering them, and has distinct yellow stripes, which makes them stand out as well. Their identities can also be confirmed not only due to observations of their anatomy, but also that Scott Hartman, a paleontologist who worked on the series as mentioned earlier, also published two skeletals of the animals earlier this year, with them as such being referenced in use for the documentary. There are potentially some other animals there too, which will appear in the documentary itself, so there's that to look out for as well. With the transition to a more snowy environment, more on that soon, a Pachyrhinosaurus is seen alongside a potential Nanooksaurus, a more northerly Tyrannosaurian, with the former appearing alongside other members of their species, and appearing to congregate in a defensive manner, similar to how muskox do today when confronted by predators. The Pachyrhinosaurus themselves, specifically the species Piperotorum, from their apparent anatomy and the presence of Nanooksaurus, indicates that this scene takes place in the Prince Creek Formation in Alaska, one of the most northerly known formations. The cool thing to note with the Pachyrhinosaurus is the presence of filaments and or quills lining the back, and a good deal of the tail, something that while being not directly known from them, can potentially be inferred from distant relatives like Cetacosaurus, even though this connection is rather tenuous at best. I'm very thankful that they didn't go full on woolly with them, like some other documentaries have done, as while also being anatomically and phylogenetically implausible, it also overstates and perpetuates the notion of Prince Creek and Alaska in general in the late Cretaceous being continually snowy and frigid. From work done by paleoclimatologists, Prince Creek had a mean temperature during the warm months of around 10 to 12 degrees Celsius and around 2 to 4 in the cold months, with a high annual precipitation of around 500 to 1,500 millimeters per year. So while definitely chilly, it wasn't exactly a frigid tundra. A good analogue for Mastrixi in Alaska would be modern taiga environments, today represented by conifer-dominated woodlands that cover much of cool temperate landmasses, e.g. middle parts of modern Alaska, or in Finnish Lapland. Sub-zero temperatures and extensive snowfall was therefore still very much plausible, and while it wouldn't have happened all the time, as stated by Dara Naish, they did still have the possibility of occurring from time to time. Regardless of whether or not the show conveys the paleo meme of Prince Creek being abyssally cold and consistently snowy environments as a rarity, the interpretation still lingers as a norm due to that being the main environment type being shown, although we'll have to wait for the full series to come out to observe how they manage it to gauge how much of the time that is indeed the case. As a little tidbit, while not technically an inaccuracy, the Pachyrhinosaurus lacks the large, tomial teeth, as can be possibly inferred from the large dip in their beak, although its size is still somewhat speculative, and because of that, doesn't take too much from the design, although it still would have been neat to see. Finally, an unidentified Elasmosaurid and potential Tyrannosaurian are shown at the end, with the latter, while appearing to be roaring, as would be thought, is actually in the middle of yawning, as confirmed by Naish, and so this animal may well be waking up for the morning, instead of issuing a distinctive vocalisation. Alongside the trailer, a teaser soon followed after that that showcased a short scene from the show, and while I was already excited from the trailer, I've been absolutely euphoric since seeing the clip, and for good reason. The scene starts off with some turtle hatchlings, from the looks of it, Olive Ridley's, standing in as a Mesozoic turtle species, with the scene then changing course from something that could easily be mistaken for a blue planet and or planet Earth clip, by introducing an incredibly adorable juvenile Tyrannosaurus, which is rendered and reconstructed incredibly well. 
The feathers and overall coloration are reminiscent of rat chicks, in particular cassowaries and ostriches, which assist in camouflage in their respective environments, helping to break up their body outline while in foliage, or in some cases, out in the open. They also have a tail tuft, which has been inferred in living animals like lions to assist in communication, something useful if, say, they were hiding and needed to communicate amongst each other if a threat had passed, or if one of the parents was approaching. The coloration on the scales is also a nice yellow and green, and also have a neat patch of red under their necks, which culminates into a very pleasing but also accurate appearance. The level of detail on their legs, as they inquisitively step on the turtles, something which shows off a younger animal's inexperience and curiosity, also shows a great level of detail too, with the tarsal scoots and other smaller scales being nicely reconstructed, and, alongside this, other minor details like the sand on the filaments, the eyes contracting in order to focus, as well as their footprints and sand displacements being made, as they move, show a great attention to detail as well. Of course, the main takeaway from this teaser, aside from the adorable juvenile animals, is the Tyrannosaurus father, affectionately nicknamed Hank by some due to their hefty stature and confident appearance and is hands down one of the best looking Tyrannosaur reconstructions in media. The patterning is muscles, factoring both stripes and rosettes like jaguars and leopards, and interestingly, they also possess markings on the jaw which have been stated to resemble exposed teeth, something which given the whole lip debate, is called as incorporates on a lips reconstruction, which even though this latter option is more well supported, it's nice to see both reconstructions melded together in some way. The coloration itself, after an apparent lengthy period of discussion was settled upon, for having a pattern and coloration presence and distinctive enough to not leave them a dull, monotone brown, but also being subtle enough to not be distracting and not matching the body size, striking a near-perfect balance. Regarding feathers, this adult does indeed possess them in sparse amounts, something which could still well be the case, since as the juvenile animals grow, the feathers, which can form in between the scales, could space out as they grew. So while being quite sparse, it's great to see some level of feathering still being retained in the adults. There have been some comments that I've noticed on the mass of the Tyrannosaurus, and that the animal appears to be more sizeable than as to what they should be, although this complaint, while not being all that common, is fundamentally flawed. Tyrannosaurus, even amongst theropods, and even other Tyrannosaurians, was an exceptionally bulky animal, and from going over the musculature, even on an observational level, and from what has also been said by those who consulted on their appearance in the series, that this Tyrannosaurus interpretation is not on the level of an overfed Sioux specimen, and is instead representative of the levels of muscle and bulk that they would have possessed in life. Not to mention that the heftiness of the adult here is influenced by them being in a more relaxed and less erect pose. As a comparison to see just how far Tyrannosaurus reconstructions have come, at least in animated paleomedia, the prehistoric planet Tyrannosaurus is a much needed upgrade when compared to the walking with dinosaurs Tyrannosaurus that's due to have a troubled design history, didn't turn out all that optimally, particularly with the feet, which unusually appear to be angular greys instead of digital greys, like how they should be. What is that? What the f is that? Overall, these reconstructions are absolutely superb, and are a much needed and long awaited change in how these animals are depicted in media with saturating and or brightening the images of the animals, revealing intriguing and beautiful patterns and colours that are otherwise hard to see or not visible due to the present lighting. Prehistoric Planets is also notably the first major dinosaur-focused documentary series produced by the BBC since Planet Dinosaur back in 2011. That's alongside Dinosaur Revolution, were really the last decent, high-quality documentaries focusing on them until now. And even then, these two series had their flaws. Planet Dinosaur for its cutaways and odd camera movements and animations from time to time, and Dinosaur Revolution that's while featuring stunning, very lifelike reconstructions, suffered from occasional anthropomorphism and the occasionally choppy animation. After that point, most documentaries from then on were severely lacking in budgets and consultation, and the quality and frequency of these kinds of documentaries dropped considerably as a result, becoming what has been referred to as a kind of dark age of paleontology in media. As such, many paleontology enthusiasts like myself have literally been waiting over a decade for something along Prehistoric Planet's line to come about, and now that it's all here in all of its glory, it's honestly hard to believe it's even happening. Numerous paleoartists being involved is also a really great sign, and with visible and clear consultation as seen by these excellent reconstructions, it really can't be stressed enough as to how important it is to not only have people that know what they are doing involved, but to also listen to them and correct accordingly. Even the best consultants and artists in the varying levels of development can't notice everything, and as well as this, can't teach a whole studio of animators all of the subtle intricacies and details of how these extinct animals functions, 
but from what has been shown so far, it really seems that this level of coordination and consultation has really paid off, and I'm really happy to see all of their hard work paying off, given how many talented Paleo artists are online and readily available today. As an example, this wide range of consultants even includes people specialising in Paleo entomology and botany, something which would normally be brushed aside, and is something which really calls back to the days of the Walking With trilogy and its strives towards incorporating as much as they possibly could with the utmost of accuracy. Well, at least most of the time. Prehistoric Planets appears to be more focused and collaborative in that regard to more out there speculation. The aspects of Walking Dinosaurs and its subsequent spin-offs that really helped to set them apart was the format and narrative structure, most notably Tim Haynes and Jasper James, setting out to make a series that felt like a standard wildlife documentary, only with prehistoric life as a focus this time around, and is something that hasn't been successfully captured in any paleo documentary since, and the balance is always off in some way for some of the reasons stated earlier. That is potentially, until now. The series is focusing on animals and environments from the latest stages of the Cretaceous, but who knows, maybe more documentaries will be produced sometime afterwards that feature other time periods and animals, but only time will tell, and it all depends on how well documentaries like Prehistoric Planet do. Alongside the also upcoming Jurassic World Dominion, this all could very well lead to another golden age regarding paleontology in the form of science communication and media. But to get there, documentaries like these need to be legitimately supported, which in turn will give credence to more shows like this potentially being made. This is quite literally something many of us have dreamed of for the longest time to see a series that rivals the original Impossible Pictures documentaries in quality, and to finally see it after all this time has been so incredibly rewarding, knowing that these animals are finally being realised in a more up-to-date manner, and with such detail and care put into their appearance from numerous paleontologists and paleoartists. From other information that I know from other sources, there's a lot, and I mean a lot more to look forward to, and I can't wait for everyone to see what will be depicted. It's the first time in a long while where dinosaurs and other prehistoric life are treated seriously and with such respect regarding a project with a large budget and quality. Paleontology media fans, after being starved for what has been years, are finally eating good once again. Very exciting times. With games like Prehistoric Kingdom and Saurian, alongside other upcoming documentaries like Forgotten Bloodlines, the future of science communication in particular regarding paleontology is potentially looking very bright indeed. So in conclusion, I'm ecstatic regarding this documentary, and also to where its potential success could lead, and I cannot wait to see this documentary come May. Thanks for watching.